Talking Futures, Mormedi. Nada, lo primero, muchas gracias por venir. Y bueno, hoy tenemos un debate muy interesante porque vamos a ver un poco una visión. Eh, bueno, Fabio y yo nos conocemos desde muchos años. Eh, eh, yo soy diseño de automoción, aunque no acabo ejerciendo en, en diseño de automoción y siempre pues, la automoción y colegas o compañeros en, en el mundo de automoción pues, se, se veía la automoción desde un punto de vista artístico ¿no? y desde un punto de vista de la forma, eh, pero esto ha cambiado, esto ha cambiado y, y yo creo que Fabio luego os va a mostrar un poco el pensamiento distinto que, que hoy tiene un diseñador de automoción. ¿no? También algo relevante respecto al diseño de automoción es que siempre trabajas a 5 o 10 años vista. Un coche se tarda 4 o 5 años en fabricar, entonces lo que tú estás pensando hoy no es para hoy, es para el 2027 o el 2028. Y esto lo que nos hace, como, eh, de alguna manera, es siempre estar pensando en cómo va a ser ese futuro dentro de 5, 8 o 10 años. ¿no? Blake viene más del, año, del área de producto, ha trabajado muchísimo tiempo en el producto, aunque lleva también la parte de diseño de transportes dentro de Mormedi. Y lo que vamos a dar luego es una visión eh, más amplia de cómo vemos el futuro de la movilidad, ¿no? Y con esta introducción, Fabio, I think it's all yours, ¿no? Uh... It's mine. Okay, so, well, thank you very much for being here. I hope this is going to be an interesting presentation for you. Um, I do it in English uh, because, porque muy, muy español es, es bien para conversar así, pero para presentar es un poco más difícil. Um, so I, I just do a quick introduction about myself and my, and my career, uh, just to explain you that, as uh, Jaime said, I am a, I am a car designer. I've been working car design for uh, more than 30 years, but my original background is architecture, so I am an architect as well. So my approach to car design is not just from the styling point of view, but is also more from the conceptual point of view. And a uh, good interesting thing is that in my career, I've been working for many different companies all around the world. So I'm Italian, everyone imagine, you know, Italian car design, of course, people live and work in Italy for Italian brands. But in fact, uh, strangely, I started in Italy, but then immediately when I moved, I moved to Japan. And I was the first one to, to start in Japan, so probably, I, I'm going to show it maybe more easily. So I started in 1985 working for a, a little Italian studio, sort of very little more media at that time, but very little. And uh, already we were in Torino, but we were designing cars. You can see here from drawing from 1985, 1986, cars and buses for Mitsubishi mostly and for many other uh, uh, international company. We used to work also for Seat until Seat became uh, uh, Volkswagen. Oh, yeah. After it became Volkswagen, they stopped to work with, with us. And that was my really beginning. And then immediately in 89, I moved to Japan, working in a studio that is very similar to what Mormedi does today. Um, at that time, uh, a design consultancy was working on product design, car design, uh, other type of, uh, of, of design, and uh, When I was in Italy, I was working for a Japanese company. Then when I was in, in Japan, I was working for uh, Renault, for example, <laughs> or for uh, a European company. So I was always on the wrong place at the, <laughs> at the wrong time. Um, but it was a very important uh, experience uh, because then it took me to come back to Europe. So I went to work for Renault in Paris. Uh, I've been lucky to be also always in very nice places, honestly. And... Um, I started at Renault working on the advanced design department, so where we do the concept cars. So this was what was a concept car for a luxury Renault we did, uh, I did in uh, 1995. And I didn't stop in Renault because, uh, because of this project, I had many contacts and uh, offer from other company. And finally, I ended up to be in Spain, in Sieges. In Catalonia. So I spent three years in Sigas, that's why I'm trying to remember a little bit of Spanish. Uh, it was from 97 until 2000, where uh, Volkswagen Group had um, a design, uh, uh, advanced design studio with about 70 people, uh, international, very international, 
And we were working for different brands of the, of the group. We were working for Volkswagen, for Seat, for Audi, for Bentley. For I was mainly doing interior because at that time I was a supervisor for the interior. And there is something interesting here. Uh, there is this uh, little drawing. It was one of my first practice on Photoshop in 97. was really at the beginning. And so it's about 25 years ago, if I'm not wrong. This is a autonomous, is the idea of showing what could be an autonomous car in 1997. So I found that back and I said, oh, but I, it was an autonomous car. You know, I, I remember that. It was just a project, uh, a sort of fantasy project that we did internally. And uh, after that, I went back again to, to France again to Renault, where I did uh, spent 10 years in a row and starting with a design studio independent uh, at Bastille in Renault, for, for Renault, but uh, independent. And then uh, I took the responsibility of all the middle size uh, range car, the Megane family, Scenic. We designed the Kangoo. And after, in the last uh, three years, I was uh, vice president interior design for the group. So it means I was managing and defining the design strategy for all the interior of the car for Renault Group, for Renault, for Dacia, for Renault Samsung Motors in Korea. And uh, so I have to say, after all of this uh, path with uh, most of the time abroad, finally, I ended up to be back in Italy. So, because in 2011, I was called by Pininfarina. Pininfarina is probably the most famous uh, Italian car design uh, house, uh, which is now more than 90 years old. And he has been designing for 60 years all the Ferrari, uh, Maserati, Peugeot, many, many cars, and many cars in the world. So I took the responsibility of the design for the company. Uh, back in Torino after uh, 25 years. And uh, I had the chance to work in many different projects. So I spent uh, less than seven years as a head of design of Pininfarina. And when you work for Pininfarina, you have the chance to work for cars like, company like Ferrari, for example, we did the 458 uh, Speciale, the California T. We work, we made a special one for BMW, which was called Gran Lusso. We did some prototypes for ourselves uh, by searching for new concept, new technology. For example, this was a hydrogen, fully hydrogen competition car. We work also for trains. Uh, we developed together with Siemens the Eurostar, and we developed, we designed all the interior and the exterior library. So the Eurostar is the train that goes from Paris to London. Uh, we did uh, machines like the snow groomer, like tractors. So it was a very complete experience that was covering all the different fields of transportation. At the same time, giving me the possibility to work with many companies around the world, from Italian company, German company, uh, French company, uh, Czech, and Chinese. We work a lot for Chinese car company. So in the last 10 years, I've been spending much time before uh, the, the pandemic. I was basically going four or five times a year in China and developing many projects with Chinese company. And then, uh, yes, so I show you maybe some videos of some of the projects that uh, I've done at Pininfarina and uh, showing the way the project were done. So basically, uh, this is, is the way, for example, a, a, a concept prototype is built. Fully digital, and then at the end we, we go back and we work by hand. Because there are, especially in Pininfarina in Italy, there is a, a very important skill and craftsmanship. So 
most of those things are uh, either done by hand or either finished by hand. So we were mixing technology and craftsmanship. And uh, a car like this, a concept car like this, was done in uh, four months and a half. From the sketch to the final uh, single prototype. Los que no estáis muy familiarizados, cuando vas a un salón de automóvil y ves los concept car, realmente es fake. Eh, es decir, eh, está hecho en arcilla, está hecho en, en fibra, pero el coche no, en muchos casos no anda, pero todo lo que tocas parece de verdad. Eh... Sí. Esto es así, ¿eh? pero hay otros que no son así. Porque en Pininfarina, especialmente, estábamos también haciendo un off car, single piece, really working car. Por ejemplo, el BMW que he mostrado a antes, We did it parallel with this, but it was a fully running car with 12 cylinder and we presented in Villa d'Este. And this is another project, very important, 2016. The first, uh, I would say, uh, track uh, supercar for, for competition, full hydrogen. Actually, a de an evolution of this car, probably next year we'll be racing in uh, Le Mans with hydrogen. Has been already racing in Imola and Spa. So it was a research not only for styling, but also for all the concept of uh, using a new technology with uh, a lot of constraints, because the hydrogen is a very complex uh, uh, technology. Uh, the tanks where the hydrogen is inside, they have to resist the 700 bars of pressure, which is Incredible. So they in are case very of crash, resistant. No? Eh? In case of crash, no? In case of crash, in fact, uh, we use the, the, the tanks for the hydrogen, we let it appear on the side and we put it on the side. Those are the strongest part of the car. So if you have a crash, probably uh, the tanks are five times harder than all the chassis of the car. So they were using because the pressure is so high, and, uh, but that influenced the whole design of the car. And we did all the studies also in aerodynamic. Uh, so this was not just a simple maquette, as you were saying before. But the Sergio before also was developed later in six existing cars, unique cars, sold to six customers. So the chance working for Pininfarina was to work for production car, maybe for Chinese company where uh, you produce a car in a uh, hundred, few hundred thousand uh, units and uh, they cost maybe 15,000 euro to maybe exclusive one-off car that cost maybe four million euro each one. So made by hand. So that was something quite unusual. Not many company can do that. And this is another project. It's actually probably one of the last project I did at Pininfarina. Uh, maybe some of you, if you might know Emerson Fittipaldi, which is a Brazilian uh, world uh, B two times world champion and IndyCar two times world champion from the 70s. And he wanted to create his own uh, supercar. So we developed for him this car. And uh, the idea was to make the real car, but unfortunately the project didn't go over for problem, for financial problem. But the car, you can drive it and test it on Gran Turismo, the video game from Sony. So those images are done by Sony. Those are full digital. This is not the real car. The real car exists, but it's not running. Uh, but the car is in the game, which opens up another uh, interesting part of it. Now, the virtual part. The fact that maybe designing cars just for the virtual world, for the metaverse, yeah. would be also interesting. So for me, it was a very nice experience to imagine to have a car that lives in the virtual world. And uh, so after that, basically, I decided to change again and going back to Japan. So in uh, 2018, uh, we moved back to Tokyo. And so uh, with my wife, Kayoko, we opened up uh, a design uh, consulting, uh, uh, creative consulting uh, studio, a KF, which is more on the strategic side, on the advisory side. 
especially for uh, design, uh, like, like uh, transportation design, but also other activities that are more on the side of my wife. And by doing this uh, company in Tokyo and working more as, as a strategic advisor, we had the opportunity to work together with, uh, with Mormedi, with Jaime and Blake, and uh, that was a very nice uh, experience we had, and I'm sure we will repeat it a few yeah. times more. And uh, so in Tokyo, for example, I went over this fact of being uh, designing car for virtual uh, games, and now I'm myself into the game. Because this is the Gran Turismo 7, who came out just on, uh, in uh, March or April, last April. And so I am part of the game. In fact, I, there is a place where you go there with your car, you can choose the car, you can discuss with other car owner, where you can modify your car. And I just show up, in, not in reality, <laughs> but I show up and I give, give to the player, I give information about the history of the car, about the design, I give advice, oh, this color is gonna be better, and this type of thing. So I'm part of the game, I never imagined to do that. <laughs> But it's a totally different way of uh, being a designer. You are like Siri, but uh, advising the... Yes. <laughs> and uh, also, during this period of change, I had the opportunity, you will see, also to write a book about my experience. It's an Italian book uh, made by, uh, with Rizzoli. Rizzoli is a, is a very famous and big, uh, sorry, um, publishing company. And uh, now just came out the Korean version, but I'm still looking for the English version, the Japanese version, why not the Spanish version one day, I don't know. Okay, but now let's change the subject. Let's go to the subject of to <coughs> tonight. So Jaime asked me to have a reflection on what could be uh, a reflection about the mobility in the city of the future, so in big cities. Madrid, I'm sure, uh, has, a, has a lot of uh, aspects uh, that uh, are related to this type of, uh, of uh, reflection. And me living in Tokyo as well is, is, a, is a, an everyday uh, experience to imagine what could be a new mobility. And we were thinking about what could be the mobility also for vehicles, okay? But I'm, what I wanted to say today is that probably we are going through a major change. In these years, we are going through a major change. So what also Jaime said in the introduction, probably we have to shift completely from the thinking of the product of the car as a object for transportation through to something that is much more complex, is much more interconnected, is much more um, it's a service. It's a service, it's okay. A service, a service and a, a, a connection of services. So what I was thinking is that probably the transportation world, the car world, the automotive world, is going through a major, a major revolution, like something when uh, happened that from the candle it went to the electric bulb. It's something like that. So the electric bulb didn't, wasn't born by improving the candle. It was born by changing completely. And now we have the bulb, but we have the LED bulbs, which looks the same for this case. But in reality, it's an even bigger revolution because LED is not just light. LED is many different ways of expressing light, of expressing information, of expressing plenty of things. So it's a LED screens, LED... Uh, f flexible light, LED, medical, uh, it gave a help to completely transform also the way, for example, surgery is done today. So is this multiplicity that is what is happening now with the transportation is something that is very similar. So there is no longer the candle or the bulb. There is a multiple way of doing light or doing uh, mobility is the same thing. And because this is happening, we have to consider if, in fact, is not the answer will not be just the product, will not be just one object, four wheels, is the connection, the interconnection between all of these multiple forms and all of these multiple services. That's the way probably the big revolution we are facing now. 
And uh, of course, we can see already some of the things going on. Those are all existing today. We see individual uh, mobility, uh, public mobility, for example, this fuel cell bus hydrogen uh, from Toyota, sorry. This is already in public service in Tokyo every day, normally, hydrogen buses, public services. And uh, we, we see now all the cities full of, uh, of sharing uh, electrical vehicles, which are good, but at the same time it poses some other type of problem. So the point is not the object, but is what we do with the object, how we manage the use of the object. So that's the, the, the thing that are changing. And even uh, car uh, uh, makers and, and big uh, OEMs are also shifting and changing their way of doing things. For example, this Mobilize is a new service offered by Renault for, uh, for uh, car sharing or for, for different services uh, with um, okay, subscription. And so they develop specific vehicles that are modular, so the same base electric vehicle could be for personal individual transportation, for car sharing, for uh, delivery, and they have different forms of vehicles. So the car makers are already going over the simple fact of selling products. They start to sell services, like it happened with the mobile phone. Okay, you don't buy anymore most of the time the mobile phone, you buy the service and the mobile phone comes with it. So this is already going on, and the autonomous, autonomous car is already a reality. In mo most of the car today, of the most recent car, have already a, an autonomous function. Now the problem is to finalize the integration of the autonomous car into a mixed environment and finding the right uh, um, regulation to make it uh, acceptable. But uh, the technology exists already. And then when you do an autonomous car, then you think not only about people, you think about sharing service, about delivery. <coughs> and the object can be completely, sorry, can be completely different. So it can be completely different because they, beca they become moving space. You don't need any more the space for the driver. You need to have another experience, another our moving living space. So that's the way we should probably start to think more about car, no, not so longer as an individual vehicles, which probably will continue to exist, but in a separate shape. And then having multiple multifunctional moving space that will be available. And uh, this of course is uh, also true with many other way of uh, uh, transportation and all of those ways of transportation, either by air, delivery, people, or either by rail, they will have to be integrated. So the future of transportation in big cities will be multiple form integrated into an offer of multiple services, coordinated and interactive. I think that is it. Probably had still few more slides by saying I'm living in Tokyo so you can see that somehow in Tokyo is already there are already multiple layer multiple level of of uh, mobility and for example you have these wall are the imperial garden and you have highways going on top of it uh, and then another interesting thing is that most of the highways in Tokyo have been built on top of the canal which were the main transportation uh, channel for the, for the city in the century before. So when the car arrived, they built on top of it. So again, a, a way to try to integrate different forms of uh, transportation. transportation. And by doing that, what happened? What happened that if you live in the center area of Tokyo, they become almost like a pedestrian. Uh, you can go by car, not here. There is another street behind. And you can go by car. But if you walk around in the center of Tokyo, it's like this just like being in the countryside and you don't have many cars going around because the cars are mainly on the big axis and most of the people move around in, uh, with public transport and other different forms. Thank you. So. Thank you, Fabio. <laughs> right.
Well, the whole day news was not too quick, but... Uh, Thank you, Fabio. That's fantastic. Great to see some of those old uh, cars that you've designed and some of the newer ones. But you've really set me up very well. Do you want to add the uh, presentation? So today we want to talk about the modularity, oh, yeah. about modular mobility. Uh, Momiri kind of often creates its own vision of what a particular uh, future would be, whether it be in banking, whether it be in mobility, whether it be in product design. We oftentimes will do our own concept cars uh, that will actually help to promote conversation, express our point of view, but also to kind of get that uh, kind of, let's say, discussion going about what is really important as we start to build towards mobility of the future. And today we're going to show... I'm getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were asking the question, what does the future of urban transportation look like? Uh, and how can modularity improve cities for our citizens? So we're going to try and answer uh, that question in our way today. As we see, cities are a large living entity. We see it's not just a group of people, but there's a social dynamic, there's a, a cultural interaction. But at the same time, it's our responsibility to make them cleaner, more livable, more sustainable. And this is something I think a lot of cities are really struggling with. As we get bigger, more complex, how do we make them better to live in for our citizens? We see that they go 24-7, 365. There's this ebb and flow. Cities breathe in, breathe out during the day, during the night. And we need to think about how we optimize our systems. It's not just nine to five, it's 24 seven. And just because we have more mobility options doesn't necessarily mean better experiences. So how can we coordinate, how can we guide these systems to, to interact better with each other and to really deliver proper services and personalized services for that need, whether it be transporting people, uh, logistics, or services around the city. And of course, we always need to keep in mind this ever-changing world. Life is very dynamic, very connected, and it's important that we are tracking the future needs of our citizens. And we're seeing that diversity of people within a city, whether we have a child that's only ever known the internet, or <laughs> an older person that is resistant to new technologies, we need to cater for such a broad range of people and abilities. As we know, MMAS or MAAS, Mobile as a Service, is becoming very common now. We have Uber and we have many other services that we see. So people are getting used to that. They're getting used to moving away from personal car ownership. And we think that there needs to be a further push towards that. And you can see here with some numbers that really show the growth in that industry. Of course, as, as uh, Fabio was mentioning with flying cars, we need to look to the future about what are the new forms of transportation? How is our infrastructure going to work with that? And what are the platforms we need to build to make sure that we are ready for this dynamic change in the way we move around our cities? And, and this that could <clears throat> sounds futuristic. I mean, Ferrovial that uh, you all know probably, I mean, is already investing into 35 uh, vertiports. It's constructing them, no? So th this is gonna be a reality. Uh, in a year or a year and a half time, no? Exactly, this is really coming fast, which is why we want to create these conversations to start people thinking about it now. And we see mass transit serves a great need, but we need a bigger shift. So buses, metro, trains, they offer a, a kind of one size fits all approach. So how do we start to think about creating more personalized services within the city? So what we do is we start with data, we look at you know how uh, the layers of safety, traffic, uh, people movement, what happens across the city. And we analyze the movement of the city, really. And we start to see patterns. We start to see uh, different areas of different use and how we can enhance the flow across the city or in certain areas. And you can see here, we look at like bike, vehicle, and pedestrian flows. And we, we analyze this data and we start to see opportunity. We start to see holes or we start to see open spaces that say, if we did this a little different, maybe we can actually start to in in improve the way people live and move in the city. But one of the biggest slides in this deck is this one. So the average use of a private vehicle is 4%. So the other 96%, that vehicle is sitting doing nothing. So even taxis, maybe they only got a shift for eight hours, 12 hours, then it goes and parks somewhere. It's an incredible waste of our precious resources and our space within the city. Remember this slide because it's a really important point. 
to really thinking about if we really want to create change in our cities to, for the better, then we really need to challenge ourselves. And change is important. We need to change the way we move. Introducing our concept, uh, 101 Modular Mobility. So in this concept, we have an integrated system that helps to better manage the resources and provide more sustainable, flexible, and personalized options for moving citizens, services, and industry within your city. And this is what it looks like in one configuration. So the idea is we're trying to create a seamless approach, but made up of modules. Okay, so we have uh, two common power modules on the front and the back, and they pick up the service volumes or the cabins. And I'll show you how that works. So here you have the independent autonomous power modules that are self-balancing when they're on their own. They move autonomously, autonomously through the city. You can see here that they're able to, to self-balance and sustain themselves. They're battery electric powered, and they also can adjust their suspension. And what does that mean? That allows us to bend down and pick up our cabin. So here you can see the one, zero, one. Okay, it's a digital system, it works together. You remember, I mean, the, the car horses, I mean, it's the same concept, but set of horses with uh, autonomous driving. No? Now remember what we said about cars are, for 96% of the time, they are doing nothing. So imagine if you could pick up the engine, move it next door and pick up, you know, a, a space or a room and then move that. So the idea is that the power modules come in, they, they next, get next to the service module, they kneel down, they come in and engage with the electrical, mechanical, and all the other structural services, and then they lift it up and they go. It's as simple as that. Of course, we have a broad range of service modules for every need, okay? So we have, uh, these vehicles can be reconfigured autonomously and quickly, so they can move from one and then move to another as soon as they've reached the destination for that volume. We have here uh, cargo of different types. This could be a food truck that gets dropped off in the park on the weekends, or we can have a mini uh, taxi or a mini bus, or we can even utilize the individual mod module to deliver smaller goods around the city. Of course, we need to coordinate all of that. So we have a, a systematic approach to the city movement. We coordinate everything together. So the system is using these power modules and they're arriving just in time when you need it are then going to charge when it needs to be uh, refueled. And we want to make sure that we're also using it to, uh, oops, sorry, to actually use sensors within uh, the autonomous vehicles to actually have a real-time monitoring of the environment of the city. So we know the humidity, the pollution, and all the other things that are happening within the city real-time from every part of the city. Here we go, pure energy. So we have power modules that are actually interchangeable and can be charged in place or actually exchanged as the, as the batteries get lower and maybe aren't working so well. The service modules, we're integrating different forms of power that they can generate on their own uh, to charge their own batteries to have the module stand alone. And of course, it's, it's autonomous, it's independent, it's interchangeable. Uh, when, you want, when the battery is low, they go off on their own and they find the charging. So they can either come in and they can kneel down and contact charge or induction charge, depending on the need. Obviously, induction is a little slower, but it can be, can be very functional as well. And then they, when they're finished, they up and off to their next job. So we want to make sure it's accessible. We want to make sure that there's clear signage that everyone knows from the outside, what is that vehicle doing? We also want to make sure that we have the independent suspension is, best, is put to good use so we can actually lower the vehicle down so people can access the vehicle easily but also utilizing ramps and interiors where we have flexibility, fold up chairs that allow you to have a range of people access it through different mobility needs. Of course, using LIDARs, cameras and sensors to work in unison. Uh, Real-time hyperlocal data is good to, to create a detailed view of the city's health, as I mentioned, but also smart lighting that switches from the rear to the front and allows you to know what's going on with that actual vehicle. <coughs> So there's multiple use cases, anywhere from limousines to ambulances, waste disposal for overnight, uh, cargo logistics, all powered by one system, 101. 
So you just dial up the service that you want, and you're creating a, a new way to move, a new way to deliver, empowering new communities and events, enhancing logistics, at the service of overall efficiency, moving better, moving together, connecting you with the city. So here you can see, even thinking about how we can have augmented experiences within the actual modules themselves to, to tell you what are the points of interest within a city or where you're going with the maps. Integrating with your everyday routines, whether it's charging or coffee, and improving the overall city flow for, for the city itself and for the, the best use of resources to improve the lives of our citizens. Thank you.